بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected brothers and sisters, our ulama, this program today it's been convened to discuss the life of Imam A'zam, the greatest Imam. We don't say this term, the greatest Imam, just as a rhetoric. It's not a rhetoric, that's actually the title that's been bestowed upon him by many of the scholars of the past and that's what he's been so famously known by that title that the area in Baghdad today where his tomb is and where he was buried it's called A'zamiyya so A'zamiyya is actually attributed to Imam A'zam so A'zam means the greatest so this entire area is now called A'zamiyya which is this area of Baghdad, just like you have other areas of Baghdad, like Karkh and other areas. Like in Istanbul, you have the Ayyubiyya area because uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu is buried there. So that's what shows that when an area can be renamed by a person, then that shows their greatness and that shows their acceptance to a certain degree as well. Now this man was a very interesting, extremely interesting individual. And we could probably speak all day about him. Today I've uh, prepared, I haven't really prepared uh, any kind of systematic discussion or some kind of academic essay on him. I'm really going to be speaking at random about things that just stand out to me and that are very inspirational for me from his life. And hopefully, inshallah, we can benefit. We have a very short amount of time. But in that time, all I want to mention is that the way he starts off is obviously as a merchant, not as a scholar. But while he's a merchant, it appears that he gains so much knowledge just by discussing with people. He's a merchant in Kufa. And Kufa is a garrison town that was established by the Muslims. Kufa and Basra were two towns that were established by the, during the time of Umar anhu for the Sahaba that had come over from Medina Munawwara and wanted to settle in, in Iraq after it had been after it come under the Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic rule. So Kufa was a bustling place. Today, it doesn't seem like it's got the same bustle and hustle, but in, in that day, that was an extremely cosmopolitan society. And you can imagine a place like London. Uh, Basra was probably a bit more like uh, Birmingham, right? Some people will understand what I mean. But uh, Kufa, was, Kufa had its issues. Kufa had its issues as well. In fact, according to some people, uh, they, they, they considered Kufa Ahlu Shiqaqi wa Nifaq, right? The, the people of dispute, because they, 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 there was a problem earlier on with Ali radiallahu anhu. In fact, once somebody said that to Imam Abu Hanifa, that that's the area he comes from. And he was in Medina Munawwara, so he responded, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ مَرَدُوا عَلَى النِّفَاقِ that from the people of Medina, there are certain people who are, uh, you know, who are very strong on hypocrisy. So, the thing about Imam Abu Hanifa is that during this time as a merchant, it seems like he picked up a lot of knowledge just by discussing with people. Because somebody comes to your shop and you're selling cloth. You know, cloth is something you show people, you discuss with them. And if you're a person of interest and you're a person who's interested in discussion and uh, in, in conversation, you're going to be speaking uh, to these people. So he seems to have become a great theologian first, in the sense that he'd mastered theology. He went to Basra uh, over 20 times to go and uh, debate with the sectarians. Anyway, that's a long history. I want to move on beyond that. What are the few things that I find with him is that when he finally turned to studying the knowledge formally, and he sat at the feet of Hamad, and he began to study fiqh, that's... He, he excelled in that. Imam Abu Hanifa was a natural genius, that's what I would say. He was an absolutely natural genius. Whatever he picked up, he excelled at. Extremely proficient. Extremely proficient. We're just really happy to have him on our side. Let's put it that way. Right? So, 
What happens is, he studies fiqh and he masters it. His teacher eventually passes away, he takes his place, he starts teaching. This young, this young person comes along and begins to study by him. After a few days, that young man disappears. He disappears. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, had seen a spark of interest in this young individual. He goes and inquires about him. Where is he gone? Apparently, this young individual was uh, somebody from a very poor background. He'd fa his father had pulled him out of the madrasa, uh, out of the studies after some days or whatever, because he needed to earn a living for him. So he'd put him to work. Young, young person. So Imam Abu Hanifa discovered this, so he said, you know, he went to his father, he said, I'll pay for whatever he is going to earn in a day, I'll pay you that much. You just let him study with me. Imam Abu Hanifa did not close his business when he carried on, when he, when he uh, turned to formal study. He did not close his business. He had somebody else look after it. He had somebody else take care of it. You know, he had employees to, to, to look after the business. So he continued that. He was extremely generous of nature. And you can understand from this that because he wanted this particular student who he'd seen a, you know, a genius in, he wanted him to study. This was none other than Imam Abu Yusuf, the second great Imam that we have among our founding Imams. He actually paid for his study. He paid for his study to study with him. So he took him away from his father. He said, he'll study with me and I'll pay you. Subhanallah, I mean, I wouldn't mind. You know, if somebody did that for me, you know, go and study and they'll pay my father or pay me. I don't mind. Bismillah. Subhanallah. Anyway, today, today they actually do that post PhD, uh, uh, post, uh, what do you call it? Post uh, uh, doctoral research. They pay you to sit and read and write. Unfortunately, Muslims don't do that. Unfortunately, we don't have that heritage anymore. Right? Where we can take our students and, and spend money to develop them further. You know, subhanAllah, the universities do that today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that tawfiq. So now, he bec he, he, he's teaching fiqh. He spends huge amounts of money on uh, the profits he makes from his business. He spends it on ulama. Sufyan al-Thawri, su sorry, Sufyan ibn Uyayna used to be his contemporary. Once one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa met Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Sufyan ibn Uyayna rahimahullah, he says to him that what's wrong with your imam? He gives us so many, he sends us so many gifts that we're embarrassed to take it. It's like an embarrassment, you know, in the sense that, you know, one is you go and give somebody a pen as a gift. You know, better still, you go and buy somebody a, you know, Galaxy Note, right? I don't like iPhones. So, you know, you give somebody a Galaxy Note or something like that. Another one is that, you know, you go and buy him a car. That's a bigger gift. But one is that you give him so much that they're even embarrassed to take it. Like, man, you're giving me so much. How can you do that? It's just too much. So Sufyan ibn Uyayna went and said that to one of the students, Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, the student said to him, you're lucky you only get that much, there's others who get even more than you. So he was extremely generous, extremely generous. And what I actually wanted to do today, which I don't think we have the time to do, is I actually wanted to go through his letter, his wasiyah, his special advices and his epistle that he had written to one of his star students, Uthman al-Batti, who was from Basra. We don't have the time to go through it, but one of them is that he tells him you need to spend on people. You need to feed people, you need to give them gifts, you need to, you need to look after them. That's really beneficial for, for an alim to, to build a, 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 build a connection with the people. And he says that no person who has miserliness can ever be a leader. Leadership quality is that generosity goes with it. So anybody who wants to be a leader or assume any kind of leadership role, generosity has to be part of your trait. Otherwise, you can't. And Imam Abu Hanifa showed us that in practice himself. Now, the other thing uh, randomly that I just want to mention in that regard is when Imam Abu Hanifa, he used to go often to the Haramain. He used to go to the holy sanctuaries often. And on one of those occasions, he met with Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Imam Malik was his contemporary. Imam Shafi'i was interestingly born in the year that Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. 150 Hijri, that's when Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. That's the year Imam Shafi'i was born. Right, one great Imam replacing another, it's ajeeb. But Imam Malik rahimahullah was his contemporary. So on one occasion, they went, he went to visit him. And after he left, somebody asked Imam Malik, that what do you think of this Imam? What do you think of Imam Abu Hanifa? He says, Wallahi ra'aytu rajulan law kallama hadhihi sariyati dhahaban laqama bi hujjatihi. He says that I, I've seen such a man that if he said this pillar is made of gold, he'd probably be able to, to establish evidence and proof that it is. That's how quick of mind, that's how shrewd he was, that's how, how his intellect was so profound. He was an absolute genius. 
There's no doubt about it. One of the points I want to make in that regard is that this whole discussion about the Hanafis being far from hadith, this, this is not the time to go into it in detail, but just some of the points that I've picked up. Because recently I taught a, a course on Hanafis and hadith. Hanafi, Hanafis and hadith scholarship, usul al-hadith. Uh, theory, you know, uh, hadith theory. That's what I. That's what I told. What I understood from there is that let's take a few examples. You have Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani has been considered to be one of the youngest and brightest people that studied with Imam Abu Hanifa. He was very young when he studied with him. He probably studied with him in in his teens, in his late teens, before Imam Abu Hanifa passed away. He had actually come to ask a mas'ala. He had had a wet dream the night before. And he came to ask an issue that does he have to pray Isha prayer or not if he had a wet dream. And then when he got the response, he went to the side and he prayed. He went and he prayed his, he prayed his qada prayer. Then he came and he sat in the majlis. And then he became a star student of Imam Abu Hanifa. And he is the one who is now responsible for transmitting the Hanafi school, the authentic narrations of the Hanafi school called the Zahir al-Riwayah, the six famous books. And then beyond that, the Nawadir, etc. So now, when you, when you look at a person like Imam Abu Yusuf, sorry, Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, he studies at a very young age with Imam Abu Hanifa. Then he goes to, after Imam Abu Hanifa's death, he goes to Medina Munawwara. He studies under none other than Imam Malik. And he studies with him not just for a few days, he studies with him in a way that he's able to relate the Muwatta. So he has his own recension of the Muwatta from Imam Malik called the Muwatta of Imam Muhammad. You know, it's a bit different from the it's much of it is the same, but there's some difference where he's taken some narrations, he's, uh, he's omitted others, and so on and so forth. But what's most interesting is he comes back and he does not lose his faith in the Hanafi school. Generally speaking, when you've had one teacher, then you go to another profound teacher, there's an impact. There's no doubt there's an impact on that, right? Of that second teacher on you. But here you have that he is so faithful to his Imam that he actually considers himself the Hanafi and so on. And he continues to teach the Hanafi school and relate from his teacher. Yes, he's got the one book from Imam Malik, rahimahullah, but the majority of his fiqh and his masail are related from Imam Abu Hanifa. That goes to show that he must have seen something quite amazing in Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, that, did, that he did not want to leave and abandon. He found that to be more profound than anything else. Number two, let's take another example. These are, again, random examples from history. Another one is Imam Tahawi. I mean, you know, he's a man, again, of great learning, great, uh, uh, great proficiency, again. He's a Shafi, he starts with the Shafi. His mother's a Shafi'i scholar. His uncle's a Shafi'i scholar, Muzani, who's Imam Shafi'i's right-hand man. Imam Sha Muzani is the one who says that people have not really understood the, the position of Imam Shafi'i and his real status. Imam Shafi'i was very, very young when he passed away. But it, within that time, he was able to acquire so much. Muzani said that people have not really understood the status of Imam Shafi'i. They could not have, because they did not have the level of intellect to understand the higher level of intellect that Imam Shafi'i had. They just knew him to be a great scholar. When you see about 10 scholars, you say, mashallah, they're all great scholars. But only the scholars will know who's really a great scholar. Subhanallah, because it's only a doctor that will know who's a good doctor. For us, they're all doctors. They've got a medical certificate on their wall, right? And we'll go to them. So that's Imam Muzani said that. Now, when you have somebody like him, and then you, you have Muzani, you have the, the mother of Imam, Sha, uh, Imam, Imam uh, Tahawi, who's a Shafi'i jurist, but then he himself turns to the Hanafi school and becomes such a staunch Hanafi. What does that tell you? You know, you hardly see conversions from the Hanafis to elsewhere. You hardly see it. It's a possibility and they may have occurred. Wallahu alam. But generally what you see is so many people converting to the Hanafi school. Right? There's another example that I'd like to give. A very profound example. One of the first and the founding usul al-hadith books of the Hanafi school from which the likes of Jassas, uh, Bazdawi, Sarakhsi, and all the, later, uh, uh, all the later scholars have taken from, Dabusi, etc. have taken from, is the, uh, is, is the book of Isa ibn Aban, rahimahullah. Isa ibn Aban is a student of, uh, is a student of Imam, uh, Imam uh, Muhammad as well. And it, Isa ibn Aban w w first did not want, uh, was not interested in the Hanafi school. He used to think that they go against the hadith. It's a common, common thing, they go against hadith. So, on one occasion, Muhammad ibn Sama'ah, 
Muhammad ibn Sama'ah was, a, was another student of Imam Abu Hanifa. He once took him to sit in the dars and he would constantly refuse to go. But one day he sat with Imam Muhammad. And after, after the dars was over, Isa, uh, Muhammad ibn Sama'ah says that this is our friend who uh, reckons that you know, we go against hadith. So he says, okay, ask your question. What, what question do you have? So he came with a number of questions. And the response he got was so sufficient for him that from that day he left everything else and went and started to study with, uh, with the Imam. That was just quite amazing. Now what you understand here is somebody who's opposing him, he's, he's, come with, he's come with this understanding, with this preconceived baggage that there's a problem here, they don't, underst they don't really follow hadith, they just follow their opinion, their qiyas and analogy is too far-fetched, it doesn't really relate to the hadith and so on, yet when he listens to the responses, he is convinced. You have another, uh, another simple example which many of you may have heard of, Amish was uh, the, the, the muhaddith, A'mash, Sulaiman al-A'mash. He, the, the, he was a teacher of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah in terms of transmission of hadith. But then when it came to fiqh, he studied under Imam Abu Hanifa because on one occasion what happened is he came to Imam Abu Hanifa and he said to him, he asked him a particular issue. Imam Abu Hanifa gave him a response. He says, where did you get that response from? Where did you infer that ruling from? How did you extrapolate that ruling? That judgment, where did you get it from? So then Imam Abu Hanifa very casually, he says, I relate from Amish, who relates from so-and-so, from so-and-so, from so-and-so, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he said this. That's when it clicked to Amish that the hadith that he had related to Imam Abu Hanifa was the response and was the basis for the ruling that he was looking for. That's when he made that famous statement where he said that, that we, the hadith scholars, the hadith transmitters, are merely like pharmacists who collect medicine, who stock medicine, who dispense it based on the recommendations of a doctor. Whereas the jurists, the fuqaha, they are like the, the physicians, the doctors that are able to understand uh, the issue and to extrapolate and to infer a ruling and provide that ruling. That's when he realized, that's when he realized that. And he studied under Imam Abu Hanifa like that. So what makes it that these people become convinced? After, after being opposed, they become convinced. That's, that's the amazing part. So after reading all of that, I really, really thought about this for a while. And what I realized, what I realized was that the reason why you had the opposition in the beginning and then the conversion afterwards had to be for one reason. Now listen to this carefully. The mindset of the founding Imams the way Imam Abu Hanifa, through his great uh, intellectual acumen and what he had developed within Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Muhammad, Imam Zufar, and all the other Yahya ibn Abi Zaidah, and all the other great scholars that he had around him, was this penetrating insight on taking a hadith and actualizing it, on operationalizing it, on applying it to the situation. That has been always the context of the Hanafi school. That's always been the drive of the Hanafi school. That what they do is they take the hadith and it's not just about preservation of the hadith that's the difference if you look at the books of usul like for example if you look at the the whatever is retained of the usul of usul al hadith of uh, uh, of uh, isa ibn aban rahimahullah that's been retain, re, 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 retained uh, in the books of uh, imam jassas uh, Ar Razi and uh, Bazdawi and Saraksi, what you will notice is that all of the Usul al Hadith rules, they're all based on trying to operationalize the hadith. How do we take this narration, this hadith, and apply it to this situation? They're not bothered about just preservation, they want to preserve it through action. That's the difference. So it's a very practical school. The Hanafi school has been considered to be the most practical schools. That's why it's been, it's been the madhab of the Abbasids. They preferred the, uh, the, the Qadis of the different areas to be Hanafis. And whenever a Qadi would come of a certain madhab, that's how the madhab would then, that, that's when the madhab w w would then spread in the area. Let me, just di let, me, let me just digress. Let me just digress slightly. If you, when we're talking about Basra, during the time of Imam Abu Hanifa, the teachings of Imam Abu Hanifa had not reached Basra. Yes, he'd gone there to debate on a theological level, but when you talk about jurisprudence, the, the Basrans, they had other Imams that they followed. They had other jurisprudence that they followed. When this Uthman al-Batti, 
finished studying with Imam Abu Hanifa and he wanted to go back to Basra, his hometown. Imam Abu Hanifa told him, let me give you a few advices. Among that advice is that what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to go there and start teaching and saying Qala Abu Hanifa kada, Qala Abu Hanifa kada, that you know Abu Hanifa said this and Abu Hanifa I don't want you to go and start spreading my madhab like that people will, will take you out of the masjid they'll chase you out but when Isa ibn Aban actually went to Basra he did not listen to this advice he had a lot of zeal he wanted to teach what he had learned so immediately he started teaching saying Qala Abu Hanifa hakada, Qala Abu Hanifa kada, and so on and they chased him out of the masjid because he was coming with something kind of foreign to them. Remember, that's the time of the development of the schools, development of juristic learning. So they had their own imams there. They were great scholars in, Bagh, in Basra as well. However, very different to that, Imam Zufar ibn Huzayl, who was much older, and he was also a student of Imam Abu Hanifa from Basra. He was also one of the great families of Basra. When he finished studying and he went to Basra, what he first did was he went and sat in the other groups of, uh, of jurisprudence. The other Masail groups that the other scholars were teaching, he would sit there and he would listen. And then when it was time for discussion, in those days it wasn't just like one person teaching and everybody listening. It used to be discussion. That was the method even in Imam Abu Hanifa's majlis as well. So when, he, when, when the time came to discussion, he would acknowledge their opinion. In fact, that's exactly what Imam Abu Hanifa told Uthman al-Batti, that you go and listen. If they ask you a question, you should give them a response they used to first. Then tell them, oh, there's another opinion and this is the dalil of that opinion. Right? And this works very well. When I first moved to America, I was in a community where there were no Indians, no Pakistanis, and maybe one or two Bangladeshis. So hardly any Hanafis. It was mostly Arabs from different communities, some Afghanis, and a lot of converts. Now initially I'm there, I just come out of uh, you know, studying the, uh, uh, the Dawratul Hadith. I actually had retained a lot of, the, you know, a lot of what had been taught there about Imam Shafi's opinion, Imam, Abu, uh, Imam uh, uh, Malik's opinion. And I used to give all of that because I wanted people to be able to relate. But later what I disco discovered is that that confused people. So what I would do is if I would see that there's somebody from North Africa there, I would, and I was asked a question, I would give a Maliki response without saying it's Maliki. I would say certain scholars say this, but then there's another opinion and, the, and then I would give the Hanafi opinion and I'd say and the Dalil for it is this. And you see, because when somebody's been following something all their life, that's what they've been following. And you come with a totally new opinion like some of these people do and they want to change you, right? And they want no other way but the highway, right? That, that you're gonna really confuse them. You will make them opposed to you. So this way, you, they, you've acknowledged that you understand their opinion that they've been following as the Maliki opinion, North African opinion or whatever, but then you've shown them another opinion and you've provided evidence for it. And this is what I learned from Abu Hanifa in practice. This is what I learned. So Imam Zufar, he went, he sat in the Majalis, but he used to just sit and then he used to mention that, uh, oh, there's another opinion on this issue. He never mentioned the name of whose opinion it is. He used to mention, oh, this is, so there's another opinion, it is like this, and this is the dalil for it. After a few days, a few months, or whatever it was, they became really curious. Where is this person getting all of these amazing opinions from? You know, these amazing extrapolations and inferences, where is he getting them from? So then they asked him, whose opinion is this? Then he told him, this is the opinion of Abu Hanifa. By this time, because people had respect, had grown for those opinions, now they were able to accept this opinion. That's how the, uh, the, the eventually in Basra, the Hanafi school spread through Basra. Subhanallah. So this is all about wisdom. Imam Abu Hanifa, one thing, if you look at his advices, he gave always practical advices because he dealt with people. He was really, really practical. On one occasion, somebody came to him and he said to him, uh, uh, he, he, he was scruffy. He said, Imam Abu Hanifa said to him that, you know, after the dars, he says, you know, there's some money under this rug here. Go and asli halak, you know, go and sort your situation. Go and get some nice clothes and so on. He says, I've got money. He says, why do you dress like this for? Why do you dress like this for? So then Imam Abu Hanifa advised him. He says that there's no point dressing like somebody in a way that makes people sorry for you. It makes your friends feel like, you know, sorry for you that, you know, they need to help you out. So these are very practical advices that he would give. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa was not just a raw jurist, not just a pure academic. And, you know, uh, in fact, he, he, was, he was so great in his worship, right? And in his generosity and in his, uh, in his uh, wara and in his taqwa that there's a number of uh, stories that are related to that which we don't have time to go into. I'll just mention one story. Uh, as, you, as you know, he was a cloth merchant. He was a cloth merchant. 
On one occasion, he told his, uh, uh, one of his workers that, look, uh, we need to go and deliver this particular ream of cloth to such and such a person. There's a defect on this cloth. You know, it used to be hand woven. So there's a defect in there. It was in the middle somewhere. Generally, when a person takes a cloth, they don't necessarily check every single part of it. And once the deal is done, it's done. So he says, I want you to make sure that you inform them that there is a problem here. Now the, 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 the worker, he went and he was probably in a hurry or whatever, he forgot. He just delivered the cloth, took the money and came back. When Imam Abu Hanifa inquired afterwards, that, did, you, did you tell him? He says, no, I forgot. So then when they tried to go and look for that person again, they couldn't find him again. It was maybe some traveler or something. So now what did Imam Abu Hanifa do? I mean, we would say, well, that's, I tried my best, khalas, finished, let's use the money. But he donated that entire amount. Not even like the amount of the defect, he don donated the entire amount. Right? There's numerous stories of this type. There's numerous stories of this type. I would suggest that you know you go and read some books on him. You'll understand who this great Imam is. You'll you know you really understand who this uh, who this person is. So, going back to the point, what I my theory is, and I think I have some backing in this regard, is that the level of proficiency and insight that the Hanafi Imams had in Hadith and how they could extrapolate rulings that others could not see. This is what initially led people to say and accuse them of going just according to opinion and not according to hadith. But when the, when the issue was laid clear, there's another example, Ja'far al-Sadiq. Same thing, he says, how come you dispute the hadith of my grandfather, you know, uh, fr from my grandfather? He says, how so? He says, well, you say this? He says, no, this is what I do. If, if that was the case, then I would, never have, I would never have said that you make masa on the top of your feet. I would have said you make it at the bottom because on the bottom of your socks, because leather socks, because that's what gets dirty, not the top part. But I go with the narration in this. And there are so many cases like that. So when people recognize the depth of knowledge and the depth of inference and profound inside then they recognize okay but when they don't do that and just superficially because they can't see it they they claim that they they allege that these people are, uh, are against the hadith so when it comes to his piety as well he has been mentioned for example by Allama Sha'arani in his uh, in his tabaqat on the awliya in his tabaqat on the awliya he's mentioned him in there as well to 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 finish off all i want to mention is that you need to understand this madhab. It's a very practical madhab. I know there's one issue that we suffer from, right? And I'll be very honest about it, is the jama' bayna salatain, the combining the prayers. That's the toughest issue in the Hanafi school, right? The other imams there, it's very easy for the followers of you jama' you know, you, you combine dhuhr and uh, asr when you're on, uh, on a travel, uh, on a journey, uh, when you're traveling, or maghrib and isha in the Hanafis, we can't do that according to the superior opinion within the madhab. That's the difficult part. But in everything else, when you look at buyu and everything else, it's had the greatest exposure. It's had exposure in India. It's had exposure in the Ottomans for 700 years. It had, it's had exposure through the Abbasids. The majority of our history has been filled with, dominated with the Hanafi school. And today, at least half of the Muslims around the world are Hanafis, at least. And they seem to be the most closest to their school in general, wherever they go, because it's such a practical school. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill the grave of the great imam and the, all the founding imams and all the mashaykh of the, all the great fuqaha of the past until our day may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill their graves in nur may allah reward them abundantly on our behalf for this great extrapolation they've done and subhanallah one last thing imam abu hanifa was asked after his death in a dream he was asked that you know what 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 is it that helped you all your fiqh etc he says no what helped me was everybody's criticism all this, all, everything, all the extension of their tongue and the bad things that, that they said about me, that is what really helped me. Because that gives reward when you do ghibah about people, when you slander people and so on and so forth.